Hey, you found us. Welcome, everybody. This is Scripture Gems. Hello, and welcome to the show. My name is John Fulmer, and this is my brother Jay. How's it going, John? We are two brothers who just can't get enough of the scriptures. Yeah, we love them. This episode, we are going over the Come Follow Me lesson for July 10th through 16th, 2023. This is covering Acts chapters 6 through 9. And now let's bring out the star of the show, the scriptures. Hello, scriptures. So great to see you. And now let's consult the Scripturematic 6000 to find out how long it will take to read this week's reading. 23 minutes, 15 seconds. Oh my goodness, not long at all. What would it be daily? 3 minutes, 19 seconds. So easy to do. Here we've got time codes if you want to take it chapter by chapter. Otherwise, buckle up and we'll talk about them all together. So let's get into the story. As the church grew rapidly... How would it be possible for the apostles to care for the needs of all the members? Let's take a look at Acts chapter 6, starting in verse 1. And in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring among the Grecians against the Hebrews, because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Now, the Grecians were Greek-speaking Jewish Christians, and the Hebrews were Palestinian Jewish Christians. Right. Verse 2. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them, and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. See, because the apostles were responsible for preaching the gospel to all nations, like it says in Matthew twenty-eight nineteen, they were unable to personally attend to every individual need of the church members. So, look for what they did to solve the problem. Going on in verse 3. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. And then, look at the result. Verse 7, And the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. You know, this reminds me a little bit of when Moses was chastised for trying to do everything himself, and the apostles obviously realized that they couldn't. And by bringing in these other disciples, it just exploded the work of God. Now, the Institute Manual says, These men served under the direction of the Twelve with the specific task of caring for the poor and needy. It is not known what priesthood office the seven men held. Now, look at what happens when the people strive to resist the influence of the Holy Ghost. Let's look at verse 10. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. This is Stephen. Then they suborned or bribed men, which said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. Oh, man. Yeah, that's pretty low. They couldn't possibly resist the spirit that Stephen brought with him as he spake, so they had to lie. Yeah, well, lie and then have this governing body rule against him. Right. So in the next few verses, Stephen is brought before the Jewish governing council called the Sanhedrin. The Institute Manual says, Those who oppose Stephen were from one or more synagogues where Jews from foreign lands worshipped. Libertines were former slaves who had gained their freedom. Cyrenians were Jews from northern Africa, Alexandrians were Jews from the Egyptian city of Alexandria, and Cilicia was a Roman province of Asia Minor. From the accusations made against Stephen and his defense, it appears that his opponents were angered by his teachings, that the coming of Jesus Christ had redefined basic Jewish concepts regarding the land of Israel, the law of Moses, and the temple of Jerusalem. Let's go on in verse 15. And all that sat in council, looking steadfastly on him, saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. Wow. 
From the Institute Manual, it first quotes Elder Bruce R. McConkie teaching that Stephen was transfigured. This holy transfiguration was one way God showed the people that he approved of Stephen and his message. Then the manual goes on to teach that by opposing Stephen and his testimony, the Jewish leaders were also opposing God, who had given an obvious sign showing his approval of Stephen. In the life of Stephen, we see a reenactment of parts of the life of Moses, notably his transfiguration and rejection as one of God's authorized servants. Stephen's experience also echoes the transfiguration of the Savior, further underscoring Stephen's charge that opposition to Moses and opposition to Jesus Christ were historic patterns in Israel's resistance to God. And speaking of history, let's go on to Acts chapter 7. Throughout most of this chapter, Stephen, in response to the accusations against him, recounted quite a bit of Israel's history. The Institute Manual breaks it down this way. Stephen's speech to the Jewish council focused on great pillars of Jewish identity. Number one, the land of Israel. Number two, the law of Moses. And number three, the tabernacle or temple. Stephen gave the historical background for how the Lord had given each of these three blessings to Israel and showed how ancient Israel had rejected them. Stephen concluded with a denunciation of his accusers, declaring that they were like their forefathers. Stephen argued that his accusers had rejected the Savior, just as some Jews in ancient Israel had rejected Moses. He said to his accusers, Your fathers have slain the prophets, which showed before of the coming of the just one, of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers, thereby declaring that some of the Jewish leaders were responsible for the betrayal and crucifixion of Jesus Christ. The Jews in Stephen's day were aware of the promise that the Lord would send them a prophet like unto Moses. In these verses, we should also include a commentary on verse 48, which reads, Howbeit the Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands. The Institute Manual says that sometimes Acts 7.48 is used by critics of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints to find fault with the practice of building temples. But Stephen did not imply that Israel had been wrong to build the tabernacle or the temple. After all, God had commanded the Jewish temple to be built. Stephen meant that God was not confined to the physical structure of the temple, as some people believed in ancient times. Elder Bruce R. McConkie taught, quote, The great Creator, by whom all things are, dwelleth not in temples made by the hands of his creatures, but he is worshipped by them in his temples, which holy houses he visits occasionally, and in which sacred spots his spirit may always be found by the faithful. Close quote. Nice. Let's read another part of Stephen's stinging accusations to the Sanhedrin. As we read, we should ask ourselves, though, if these accusations apply in some small way to ourselves. Let's look at verse 51. Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost. As your fathers did, so do ye. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before of the coming of the just one, of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. That is brutal. Let's see how that went over with his audience. Let's pick it up in verse 54. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God, and Jesus standing on the right hand of God, and said, Behold, I see the heavens opened, and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. The Institute Manual tells us, Stephen was full of the Holy Ghost when he saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. In this vision, each member of the Godhead was manifest as a separate being. The prophet Joseph Smith taught, Stephen saw the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Any person that had seen the heavens opened 
knows that there are three personages in the heavens who hold the keys of power, and one presides over all. Well said. But did his accusers celebrate this experience? Let's keep going in verse 57. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. If you'll recall our discussion of the trial of Jesus, the Jews admitted that by the law they could not put a man to death. That had to be done through the Romans. I guess they couldn't wait. Hmm. You know, it's interesting to me. The New Testament and other scriptures often portray human nature. When they are confronted with the Spirit, and it contradicts their way of doing things, and they are confounded, they can't argue it. What happens next? They turn to name-calling and violence, a problem that still happens today. Now, although Stephen lost his life, what did he gain? The Institute Manual tells us Stephen is generally considered to be the first Christian martyr. As he faced death, Stephen followed the Savior's example by forgiving his killers and placing his spirit in God's care. Luke may have included Saul in the account of Stephen's death in order to prepare the reader for the account of Saul's conversion. Luke recorded the interesting detail that those who stoned Stephen laid down their clothes at the feet of Saul. And notice the footnote in verse 58b, where Saul is called a young man. The footnote tells us the Greek word used identifies a man who is younger than 40 years of age. So just putting the age range into perspective. That is nice. So let's go on with Acts chapter 8. And let's meet this young man, Saul, starting in verse 1. And Saul was consenting unto his death. And at that time there was a great persecution against the church which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul... He made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing, or dragging or pulling, men and women committed them to prison. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere, preaching the word. I love that even though Saul was putting men and women in prison and scattering them, generally causing havoc for the church, that everywhere the saints were scattered, they preached the word of God. Take a look at this chart from the Institute Manual. It's amazing to think that God can even use persecutions and hardship to grow the kingdom. Now let's meet Philip. He's one of the seven that were called, and he is one of my heroes. So let's read some more about him. Going on in verse 5. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits crying with loud voice came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsies, and that were lame, were healed. And there was great joy in that city. But there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery, and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one, to whom they all gave heed, from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. And to him they had regard, because that of long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. But when they believed Philip, preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Then Simon himself believed also, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. Now, the Institute Manual says, in fulfilling his responsibilities, Philip preached, baptized, cast out unclean spirits, and performed other miracles. 
Philip appears to have ministered as a holder of the Aaronic priesthood. He had the authority to baptize, but did not have the authority to give the gift of the Holy Ghost. Those whom Philip baptized had to wait for the arrival of Peter and John, holders of the Melchizedek priesthood, to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Right. Now, in the next few verses, Peter and John came to Samaria after hearing that the people there had accepted the word of God. They prayed that the converted Samaritans would receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Going on in verse 17, Then they laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. And when Simon saw that through laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power, that on whomsoever I lay hands he may receive the Holy Ghost. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, of this thy wickedness, and pray God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. Then answered Simon and said, Pray ye to the Lord for me, that none of these things which ye have spoken come upon me. And they, when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, returned to Jerusalem and preached the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. I wish we knew what happened with Simon. I love that his attitude turned, it seemed, to repentance, but the apostles told him that he needed to change, that he needed to call upon God. And his response to them is, can you do it for me? Mm. So I don't know if Simon ever came to that understanding. Well, knowing that Peter and John had things well in hand, the Lord needed Philip for another special mission. Right. Verse 26. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise, and go toward the south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went. And behold, a man of Ethiopia, an eunuch, meaning an official, of great authority, under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure and had come to Jerusalem for to worship, was returning, and sitting in his chariot, read Isaiah or Isaiah, the prophet. Then the Spirit said unto Philip, Go near, and join thyself to his chariot. Now, if you're Philip, what would you be thinking? I'm a nobody. How could I possibly approach this high-ranking person from the royal courts of another kingdom? I would be very intimidated. But look at Philip. If the Spirit tells him to, he just does it. And look at his enthusiasm. Going on in verse 30, And Philip ran thither to him, and heard him read the prophet Isaiah, and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I, except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. I love, I love that line. It's so good. It should give hope to all of us. How can I understand Isaiah except some man should guide me? <laughs> no. And look at how natural this exchange is. Hey, uh, what you reading there? Is that <laughs> Isaiah? Do you understand that? I might be able to help you. Isn't that what many of us say when we read Isaiah? And that poor fellow didn't even have scripture gems to help him. <laughs> but Philip can. Right. Verse 32. The place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter. And like a lamb dumb before his shearer, so opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation his judgment was taken away, and who shall declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. Here he's reading from Isaiah 53, verses 7 and 8. Right. Verse 34. And the eunuch answered Philip, and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this? Of himself, or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. 
And they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. Can you see why we love Philip? The Lord knows he is willing and that he can ask him to do whatever is needed and he will go. I long to be a servant like him. Later, we'll learn that he has four daughters that all have the gift of prophecy. This is in Acts 21, 19. This is a very special family. Right. The Come Follow Me manual includes this great quote from Elder Ulysses Suarez from the April 2019 General Conference. He said that this account, quote, is a reminder of the divine mandate we all have to seek, to learn, and to teach one another the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are sometimes like the Ethiopian. We need the help of a faithful and inspired teacher. And we are sometimes like Philip. We need to teach and strengthen others in their conversion, end quote. Beautiful. The Institute Manual says, When Philip traveled south of Jerusalem, as instructed by an angel, he met and baptized a man from Ethiopia. Since Ethiopia, in present-day Africa, was not part of Judea, the conversion partially fulfilled the prophecy recorded in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, that the gospel would spread beyond Judea and Samaria, and it foreshadowed the dramatic missionary work about to commence among the Gentiles. Elder Jeffrey R. Holland said, Quote, for each of us to come unto Christ, to keep his commandments, and follow his example back to the Father, is surely the highest and holiest purpose of human existence. To help others do that as well, to teach, persuade, and prayerfully lead them to walk that path of redemption also, surely that must be the second most significant task in our lives. Perhaps that is why President David O. McKay once said, No greater responsibility can rest upon any man or woman than to be a teacher of God's children. We are, in fact, all somewhat like the man of Ethiopia to whom Philip was sent. Like him, we may know enough to reach out for religion. We may invest ourselves in the scriptures. We may even give up our earthly treasures. But without sufficient instruction... We may miss the meaning of all this and the requirements that still lie before us. So we cry with this man of great authority, how can we understand except some teacher should guide us? Close quote. This is from a great conference talk called A Teacher Come From God from the April 1998 General Conference. Great stuff. Let's go on then to Acts chapter 9. Now we come to the story of Saul who will soon be known as Paul. From the Bible Dictionary, in the article Paul, we read, Saul was born in the Greek city Tarsus and had Roman citizenship. He was a Jew from the lineage of Benjamin and was educated in Jerusalem by Gamaliel, a well-known Pharisee and respected teacher of Jewish law. Saul became a Pharisee and he spoke a Hebrew tongue, probably Aramaic, and Greek. He was later known by his Latin name, Paul. And from the Institute Manual, we get this insight. On one occasion, the prophet Joseph Smith described Paul's physical appearance. Quote, He, the Apostle Paul, is about five feet high, very dark hair, dark complexion, dark skin, large Roman nose, sharp face, small black eyes penetrating as eternity, round shoulders, a whining voice, except when elevated, and then it almost resembles the roaring of a lion. He was a good orator. Close quote. Now remember what we just read in the last chapter. In Acts chapter 8, verses 1 through 3, Saul was consenting unto the death of Stephen. He made havoc of the church, entering into every house, and hailing men and women, committed them to prison. So now let's take a look at Acts chapter 9, starting in verse 1. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest, and desired him letters to Damascus to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. Now that's an interesting phrase in verse 2, this way. 
The ESV Study Bible points out that the Greek here is hodos, which means road, highway, way of life, meaning either the way of salvation or the true way of life in relation to God. Luke mentions this throughout the book of Acts. And from an article on Bible.com, it says, quote, The earliest disciples were called followers of the way, which is important because Christianity was never meant to be just another religion, but a way. It's both a journey and the path you walk on. It's not static, but in constant motion. It's not just one choice, but a lifetime of choices, end quote. Oh, that's good. Another way to think of it is that Jesus declared himself to be the way, the truth, and the life in John 14, 6. So it is the path centered on Jesus himself. What a great way to think of our journey as disciples, the way. Right. Let's move on to verse 3. And as he journeyed, this is Saul, he came near Damascus and suddenly... There shined round about him a light from heaven, and he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. What an experience! In verse 5, to kick against the pricks refers to a goad, a prick, or a sharp stick used to make animals move. In this case, to kick against the pricks means to fight against God. And just imagine for a minute what that would feel like. Someone is prodding you with a poking stick, and you decide to kick against that. It just makes things a whole lot harder. Right. Now, how about that question in verse 6? Saul was no longer kicking back against the Lord, but asked, What wilt thou have me do? It's interesting that the answer to Saul's question will come through the Lord's servants and not directly from Jesus' mouth. I think Jesus is trying to teach Saul and us a lesson about recognizing the authority of those the Lord has chosen. From the Institute Manual, we have this short but great quote from President Ezra Taft Benson. This comes from an Enzyme article in January 1973, where he says, quote, A man can ask no more important question in his life than that which Paul asked, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? A man can take no greater action than to pursue a course that will bring to him the answer to that question, and then to carry out that answer, end quote. Fantastic. Now, there are three accounts of Saul's road to Damascus experience. They can be found in three different circumstances in Acts. This is Acts chapter 9, chapter 22, and chapter 26. We will talk more about these differences in later lessons, but if you want to read each of them, you might have fun comparing them. Now, in verse 7, it says, The men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. The Joseph Smith translation in footnote A corrects this description and brings it in line with the description of the account in Acts chapter 22, verse 9, which reports that those traveling with Saul saw the light, but did not hear Jesus' voice as he spoke to Saul. And in verses 8 and 9, following the vision, Saul was physically blind. He was led to Damascus, and he did not eat or drink for three days. The Institute Manual has this great quote from Elder D. Todd Christofferson. This comes from a great talk called Born Again in the April 2008 General Conference. He says, quote, You may ask, Why doesn't this mighty change happen more quickly with me? You should remember that the remarkable examples of King Benjamin's people, Alma, and some others in Scripture are just that, remarkable and not typical. For most of us, the changes are more gradual and occur over time. Being born again, unlike our physical birth, is more a process than an event. 
And can you imagine what Saul is thinking at this point? All the time he had spent thinking how he did and doing what he did, all of it was wrong. Maybe he had been questioning if he was on the right path even before this moment. The Institute Manual includes this great quote from President David O. McKay. This is from his book, Ancient Apostles. He says, quote, Perhaps during those few days of comparative leisure, Saul began to wonder whether what he was doing was right or not. Perhaps the shining face of the dying Stephen and the martyr's last prayer began to sink more deeply into his soul than it had done before. Little children's cries for their parents, whom Saul had bound, began to pierce his soul more keenly and make him feel miserably unhappy as he looked forward to more experiences of that kind in Damascus. Perhaps he wondered whether the work of the Lord, if he were really engaged in it, would make him feel so restless and bitter. He was soon to learn that only the work of the evil one produces those feelings and that true service for the Lord always brings peace and contentment. Close quote. Let's go on in Acts chapter 9, starting with verse 10. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias? And he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the street which is called Straight, and inquire in the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth, and hath seen in a vision a man named Ananias coming in, and putting his hand on him, that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priests to bind all that call on thy name. Now the Institute Manual tells us a little bit about Ananias. It says, Ananias was likely the leader of the church in Damascus, and he may have been one whom Saul had targeted for arrest. This would explain Ananias' initial reluctance to seek out Saul after the Lord commanded him to do so. Nevertheless, Ananias was obedient to the Lord, and he helped place Saul, a future apostle of the Lord Jesus Christ, on the path of faith and forgiveness. Going on in verse 15, But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way. For he is a chosen vessel unto me, to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Now, the Institute Manual has a quote from President Thomas S. Monson. This is from the October 2004 General Conference. He says, quote, When the Savior was to choose a missionary of zeal and power, he found him not among his advocates, but amidst his adversaries. The experience of Damascus' way changed Saul. Of him the Lord declared, He is a chosen vessel unto me, to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. Saul the persecutor became Paul the proselyter. Close quote. Great line. But what about verse 16? That sounds pretty ominous. How much will Saul have to suffer for Jesus? We'll recommend that you add these verses to your notes on this verse so you can quickly reference the fulfillment of this prophecy. Let's go on in verse 17. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house and putting his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, hath sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight forthwith, and arose and was baptized. And when he had received meat, he was strengthened. Then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus. And straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues, that he is the Son of God. That's amazing. But how do you think his preaching was received? Let's take a look in verse 21. But all that heard him were amazed and said, Is not this he that destroyed them which called on this name in Jerusalem and came hither for that intent that he might bring them bound unto the chief priests? But Saul increased the more in strength and confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus, proving 
that this is very Christ. So what happens next? For that, we have some insight from one of Paul's epistles. The Institute Manual tells us, We learn in Galatians that after Saul's conversion, he left Damascus and journeyed to Arabia. It is not recorded why Saul went there, but he may have gone for study and reflection, perhaps between the events recorded in Acts chapter 9, verse 22 and 23, or he may have fled there for safety. He sojourned in Arabia for as long as three years. While there, Saul likely deepened his understanding of how Jesus Christ fulfilled many Old Testament prophecies. After this time in Arabia, he returned to Damascus for a short period of time before journeying to Jerusalem to see Peter and other church leaders. For information and an overview of Paul's life and ministry, see a video on the Fulmer Gems channel that will walk you through Paul's various missions. We'll put a link to it in the description. So Saul went to Jerusalem, where church members were afraid to receive him because they did not believe he had become a disciple of Jesus Christ. And in verses 27 to 31, Barnabas escorted Saul to meet the apostles and vouched for him. Barnabas was a Jew from the tribe of Levi, whose first recorded service to the church was the selling of his property in accordance with the saints' agreement to have all things in common. Remember, we talked about him briefly in the last episode. He was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost and of faith. He'll be mentioned again, so keep your eye out for him. Church members then welcomed Saul into their fellowship. When Greek Jews in Jerusalem sought to kill Saul, church leaders sent him to Tarsus. The church experienced peace and growth in Judea, Galilee, and Samaria. So now let's check in with Peter. Acts chapter 9, let's start in verse 32. And it came to pass, as Peter passed throughout all quarters, he came down also to the saints which dwelt at Lydda. And there he found a certain man named Aeneas, which had kept his bed eight years and was sick of the palsy. And Peter said unto him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ maketh thee whole. Arise and make thy bed. And he arose immediately And all that dwelt at Lydda and Saron saw him and turned to the Lord. And now we will meet a woman named Tabitha. Let's take a look at some of the lessons we can learn from this account, starting in verse 36. Now there was at Joppa a certain disciple named Tabitha, which by interpretation is called Dorcas. This woman was full of good works and alms deeds, which she did. And it came to pass in those days that she was sick and died whom when they had washed, they laid her in an upper chamber. And forasmuch as Lydda was nigh to Joppa, and the disciples had heard that Peter was there, they sent unto him two men, desiring him that he would not delay to come to them. Then Peter arose and went with them. When he was come, they brought him into the upper chamber, and all the widows stood by him, weeping, and showing the coats and garments which Dorcas made while she was with them. What have we seen so far? Tabitha was a disciple of Jesus Christ who had a living faith, full of good works and alms deeds. When she died, there was such a love for her that her friends would do whatever they could for her. They sent men and brought Peter. Look at the scene in verse 39. Widows surrounding Peter and weeping, and they showed him a physical representation of Tabitha's good works. Coats and garments handmade, using the skills and resources the Lord had blessed her with. Is there a person that comes to mind as you think of a gift, example, or comfort shared in a time of need? What a treasure those interactions are. What a monument to those who gave us selfless service when we can share their gift with others or show outwardly the impact of the gift. That's what these widows were doing. All the colors, textures, and designs were on display for a record of the amazing disciple that Tabitha was. We've talked in the past about the way scripture authors use clothing as a representation of the blessings of our covenants bestowed upon us by God. For example, my soul shall be joyful in my God, for he hath clothed me with the garments of salvation. He hath covered me with the robe of righteousness. 
from Isaiah 61.10. But I think this one from Revelation 19.8 is especially appropriate, that the saints of God will be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. These people served by Tabitha were not just displaying clothes, but it could be considered a symbolic display of the righteousness of Tabitha's works that had impacted their lives. I just love her example. And let's see what happens next. Verse 40. But Peter put them all forth and kneeled down and prayed, and turning him to the body said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes. And when she saw Peter, she sat up, and he gave her his hand, and lifted her up. And when he had called the saints and widows, presented her alive. And it was known throughout all Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. What an amazing collection of manifestations of the Holy Spirit. We see it in miracles. We see it as the Holy Ghost leads leaders of the church and disciples to share the gospel and to take the skills and gifts they were blessed with or the responsibilities that they had taken on and spreading the gospel throughout the whole area. That whole idea that they're scattered through persecution and get wherever they land in their scatterings, as hard as that must have been, There they spread the seeds of the Word of God and build up people's faith. This is very exciting. Indeed. But make sure that you tune in to our next lesson as we see this way spreading to the entire world. So keep reading your scriptures, and we'll talk to you more about them in our next lesson. We'll see you then. This podcast is not officially affiliated with The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but we're really big fans.